Profits as a percentage of GDP is still at historically high levels. Income inequality continues to widen and our rates of work workforce casualisation are world beating. At what point do wage and salary earners have a right to expect terms and conditions of employment befitting a first world democracy? Mm. Andrew. <laughs> My, fav my favourite topic. Uh, look, I you mean, live for a bit of industrial relations, don't you? Why, why, why not? Why not? Uh, no, great question. Uh, but look, I, the, to start with, I would say we do have first world terms and conditions uh, in our workforce. There's no doubt about that. Uh, we, we are world leading. Uh, on, in your opening statement, you talked about uh, profitability. And I think here, one of the things we've got to look at, I mean, we've heard a lot of commentary uh, around that and the impact that it's had on things like uh, inflation and so on. Uh, and I think if you, go, if you go back through the analysis of this, in fact, uh, we're not in a situation of a profit boom. Uh, we've got one sector in particular that has been performing extremely strongly, and that's in the face of uh, inflated commodity prices. Uh, and that's the mining and resources sector, which, of course, is fundamental to the strength of the Australian economy. But outside of that, if you extract from mining and resources across the rest of the economy, then profits are not booming. And that's particularly the case in smaller and medium-sized businesses. So the, the difference between wages share and profit share uh, hasn't changed uh, greatly across if you take mining out of the equation. If you go to the analysis that the Reserve Bank, uh, Treasury and others have... Uh, developed in this area, what it will show is that um, profits are not adding back into inflation. Now, of course, we do need to have uh, an effective uh, industrial relations system that is encouraging uh, productivity, is encouraging jobs that will deliver value uh, and that will give, deliver sustainable increases in wages, real wages growth. The concern we have at the moment is the government today introducing a bill uh, addressing a number of areas that will make the challenge of employing people more difficult for business moving forward. It will make it more difficult if you want to uh, engage somebody through labour hire, if you are, want to go into a casual job. Uh, it's much less likely that an employer is going to be uh, willing to go out and um, okay. take the hard decisions to offer All right, those let me bring in positions. Jed Carney. You're an assistant minister in the government, but you're also, of course, former ACTU president. So is that what the government's doing? Because if you look at the figures, it, it will add about a billion dollars, uh, won't it, to... To the, I mean that's that's in the 400 million a year extra. Well, nine, yeah, nine billion over a decade. Not yeah, nine decade. That's across the whole economy. Yeah, so about um, close to a billion a year. Yeah. exactly right. Do you know? Um, I was a nurse for nearly 20 years, a good union rep of my nursing union. I was um, headed up the nurses' union for nine years. I was the AC2 president for nearly 10 years. So that's. 40 years of my life um, that I've sort of had my working life that I've heard the argument that any time that we make changes that support workers and workers rights the sky's going to fall in every time you know people won't get employed uh, businesses will go broke and they never really do it never manifests that way and all we're trying to do right now with these laws is swing the pendulum back a little bit so that workers are getting a little bit more we are we you know you, we're not making it harder to employ labour hire. We're just making sure that labour hire isn't used in the wrong way and that is to undercut a negotiated terms and conditions in a workplace and it is unfortunately in some places being used for that. Um, we want to make sure we look after gig economy which has been a manifestation of the last decade where we know people don't earn enough money to make a living so they, they take risky behaviours and we know that that's where people get run over on their bikes when they're delivering your, your, uh, your delivery food or they work longer hours or they run red lights. Uh, I'm sorry Jed, I've got so, no, the, the, Nine people have died on the roads with, yeah. you know, several... It might be even yeah. more. I might have that figure wrong. So we do know that there's a correlation between making sure that people are paid properly and safety. So the gig economy is an area that we're, okay. we're focusing on. I want to bring in some other, other people, areas. and I can yeah. see that and you're very right. passionate, well. but I do want to hear from <laughs> some others. Um, we'll, we'll, come, we'll come back to safety. I, I know we've had this discussion on, on yep. my other yep. show. Yep. You exactly. really contest the, exactly. that, that figure, but... On the idea of casuals getting permanency or having the right to permanency, mm -hmm. on the gig economy, workers getting minimum entitlements, does that sound reasonable to you? Absolutely. And with all due respect, um, I really want to hear why you think even if it's, like, potentially one person or nine people or more, 
what, whatever the number is, if people are at risk of their safety within the workplace, they absolutely deserve protection, mm. insurance and safety. Same as anybody in any job, no matter what, their terms and conditions 100%. should be specified and protecting 100%. them. 100%. Um, 100%. Yeah, you're totally and, right. I can tell you're passionate, I can see you sitting there waiting. But I, I think the, the, the reality is we're in a crisis point now where inflation's going up, poverty is increasing, people need permanency, people deserve security. And when it comes to jobs, yes, you can recognise people have different credibilities in their jobs and different payments, different salaries, different terms and conditions, but the bare minimum of safety is first and foremost always. Can I just jump in here, please? I think we need to understand the facts. So look at our Fair Work Act. Act That is what essentially determines, you know, the conditions that employees will, will face. That Fair Work Act has over 200,000 words in it. It is longer than all the Harry Potter books combined. It has 800 sections. It has 122 awards. And within those awards, there are over 1,000 different pay scales. Did you know the person who puts your food down on your table at a cafe is getting paid differently to the person who picks it up? This is how convoluted our industrial relations system is. Mm. And what that does is it actually punishes workers and young people in particular, because if you're a big business that wants to operate, it is so incredibly difficult to figure out how you're actually supposed to pay people. And what is going to happen? It's absolutely tragic that people are dying. Uh, we've had nine well, deaths on it's tragic, the isn't it, the job, government's job trying to fix it? But you have to consider what is the cost of this solution. So what these reforms will do in the gig economy is they're going to create a new category of person where you're considered employee-like. So you get, you know, some of those entitlements. But what happened in Geneva, in Switzerland, where they made delivery work workers classified as employees, overnight, 77% of delivery drivers lost their jobs. That's because all of a sudden they had to apply to Uber to get employed. They weren't independent contractors like they are now. They weren't effectively their own doing, small business That's not what these laws that's will do. That's not the they same rules, They won't make them employees. Right? It's not the same. But they're employee life. It's not the same. And you'll have a similar impact. No, well, it's not Jed Carney, how is it different? Well, they're not becoming employees. They, they will be getting minimum standards. The Fair Work Commission will be able to determine what is a set of minimum standards for gig workers. Mm. They can still work any hours they want. They can still come and go. But how do they're you determine, determine that? People the work, work across... Well, let Judd Carney finish, yep. The Fair Work Commission will be able to determine that and they'll have to meet pretty specific criteria to, to be able to come under that. So all we're asking is that they get paid a minimum wage that something, mm. you know, and it may even be a five minute, it may not be an hourly minimum wage, it might be a 10 minute mm. blocks, it might be 15 minute blocks, it may not be mm. an hourly yeah. wage like you would get. As it is at the moment though, Andrew, we yeah. do have a, a class of workers which is entirely different to the rest of the workers well, in the I country. Think, I think here, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's actually um, a, a bit more complex than, uh, than what Jed's suggesting. And here, I mean, uh, if you look at things like uh, food delivery and rideshare, and these have been cited as the, the biggest mm. problem areas, so the, the major employers in that space are saying they are quite willing to agree to a set of standards going to um, pay, uh, to things like insurance mm -hmm. and record keeping. Mm. So no problem. Let's have a nationally consistent set of standards that apply in those sectors and the major employers all happy, happy to, um, to take that on. But that's not what the government's doing. That's not where they're stopping. They're going further than that. And if you listen to what the Minister Tony Burke has said uh, over recent days, see him at the press club, uh, saw him uh, on Insiders uh, on, on the weekend, um, th they're going further. So you have um, other... Uh, businesses, uh, Airtasker, for example, uh, Mabel, um, we're stretching into areas uh, like uh, the provision uh, of uh, trades and similar services uh, or um, the care sector. And the Minister is saying, look, we're, we're not going to regulate in the area of, of trades uh, like Airtasker, mm. they won't be affected, but a care sector operation, a well, marketplace... He, he says it won't be about the app itself. I heard him clarify that. No, it's I actually think... not about... It's not... You but, have to be but, employed on a, on a platform. Okay, but, but, he, but he, has, <laughs> he has made that distinction to start with and yet we have on those two particular platforms, we have um, the okay. same sectors being covered and in some cases the same workers being covered. Darcy, Darcy, sorry, Darcy, I'll just, I'll just, just quickly just... add in there. I, just, I want to come back to it quickly that we've had one or nine people, whatever the number is, is too many people that have died due to unsafe working conditions. Well... No, I'll just, no, before, totally I'll, I'll agree just, with I'll that. just finish I might have quickly. got that number sure. right. No, no, but no. between one and nine, like, it, it's neither might here be, or there. I think it's actually might be more. Well, I think it's right. more. Yeah. I think it's one or nine, their lives yeah. matter. It doesn't matter. Exactly <laughs> right. Exactly right. So what I'm, what I'm wanting to preface here is that 
every Australian, every person who works in this country deserves safe work standards. End of story. That is not up for discussion. And I think that we need to be really clear that when we're talking about, you know, equity, for example, that everyone has a right to minimum wage. They have a right for safety in the workplace. And I think we need to be really clear that that is a right, regardless of, you know, the novel of what is the Fair Work Act, is that people deserve this. People have a right to this in this country. And I think that we need to be really clear that we need to support community across the board, from young people to our senior citizens across Australia. Welcome. Just want to... Darcy, you, you are 100% correct. Um, any death, any serious injury uh, on the road, whether it's work-related or otherwise, it's unnecessary. And we've got to do everything we can to try and prevent that. Uh, I think then the, why aren't you supporting the laws? That, because it has nothing to do with safety. There is nothing in the law that the minister has brought forward, that the government has brought forward, that it will in any way address safety. And if you think about this, if you think about it, the examples that he's giving, of people, you know, um, doing courier rides uh, through traffic and so on. Honestly, you think the argument that they're going to get an extra two to three dollars an hour is going to fundamentally change their behaviours? It won't. Do you it think, won't. Do you think it, it extra? It's an interesting point you make. If they get an extra two or three dollars an hour, you, you really it you, might be. It might help them feed their families a bit better. It might right. be even one hour. They two don't to, two have to three dollars an hour. You fundamentally think that is going to change their behaviours and the way they ride? It will not. It will not. The, the only but way... But on the pay issue, I just think that's worth addressing too. Do they deserve well, well, an extra look, 2 or $3 dollars an hour? Uh, I'm, I'm not saying they don't. Uh, but I'm not saying that that will in any way fundamentally change the safety that he's talking about. So it's just, it's just not linked. OK.